Mass percent and empirical and molecular formula is going to be the topic in this third lesson in a chapter on stoichiometry. And we're first going to start off by comparing and contrasting empirical formulas and molecular formulas. We'll see how they're very quite often are this, you know, one and the same, uh, but we'll see definitely how they're different and how you can reduce one to the other. Uh, but then we'll also relate them to mass percents and we'll see how they can be used to determine the mass percents of the different elements in a compound or how these mass percents can be used to determine both the empirical and possibly molecular formulas. My name is Chad and welcome to Chad's Prep where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. On top of high school and college science prep, we also do DAT, OAT, and MCAT prep as well. Now this lesson is part of my new general chemistry playlist. I'm releasing several lessons a week throughout the school year. So if you wanna be notified every time I post a new one, subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification. All right, so we're gonna start off by comparing and contrasting the molecular formula of a compound and the empirical formula of a compound. And uh, we'll start off with the molecular. The molecular basically is just gonna tell you exactly how many of each type of element there are, how many atoms in a single molecule. And so for P4O10, we can see that in a single molecule of tetraphosphorus decoxide, there are four phosphorus atoms and 10 oxygen atoms. Now the empirical differs from that, and I say differs because it doesn't always differ, it turns out, but in this case it differs because the empirical is gonna be the most reduced integer or whole number ratio, however you wanna look at it, uh, between the atoms. So a four to 10 ratio, those are both divisible, divisible by two. And so we can reduce that down to a two to five ratio, and that would be the empirical formula instead. Now for a lot of compounds, it turns out that your molecular and your empirical will end up being one and the same. If your molecular formula happens to have the lowest uh, integer ratio, well that's gonna be your empirical as well. That's the case here with propane at C3H8. That three to eight ratio can't be reduced any further. And so in this case, the empirical formula would also be C3H8. And this is not uncommon to see both, you know, molecular and empirical being the same for compounds. So could see examples of either of these types. So now we're gonna take a look at mass percents and we're gonna uh, eventually see how the mass percent can be related to both the empirical and molecular formulas. And so we'll start with just plain old mass percents here. And so we're gonna take that 300 gram sample of calcium carbonate we dealt with in the last lesson. And we're gonna explore it and we're gonna find the percentage of carbon in the sample and the percentage of oxygen in the sample. And so in this case, we've got 300 grams and you might be like, well, okay, well, if we want that percent carbon, well, percent, carbon is going to equal the grams of carbon over the total mass times 100. And so we might look at our sample and be like, well, it's got 300 grams. And that is true, but we have to figure out how many of those 300 grams are carbon, and that's gonna be a little bit problematic. So uh, in this case, we've got nice numbers. So you might recall that the molar mass for calcium carbonate is 100. So uh, calcium's around 40, carbon's around 12. Each of the oxygens are 16 each. Three times 16 is 48, plus 12 is 60, plus 40 is 100. So a molar mass of 100 grams per mole, which makes this convenient. And we can see that 300 grams then would be three moles, and every mole has one mole of carbon, so three moles would have 36 grams of carbon. And we could write that all out, so, and then times 100, except I don't wanna do this. That was more work than I wanted to accomplish here. Uh, because it turns out that these mass percents are an intensive property, which means it doesn't depend on what size of sample you have. Whether I had 300 grams or five grams or a million grams, it doesn't matter. The mass percents were gonna work out exactly the same way. And so if you actually know the formula of your compound, it's actually quite often convenient so to not use the actual size of sample that you have, but to choose a one mole sample size. And so once again, if we did this, well, that one mole sample size wouldn't weigh 300 grams. It would only weigh 100 grams. And the key is, is that in, in one mole of calcium carbonate, I can really easily see that it, there's only one mole of carbon, one mole of calcium, three moles of oxygen. And so in this case for carbon, there's only one mole of carbon and one mole of carbon right off the periodic table weighs 12 grams. And so here makes per, doing percentages here real easy as well. 12 over hundred times hundred is gonna get us 12%. And again, had we done 36 grams out of 300 grams times 100, we would have got the same answer. It just would have been more work. We had to figure out how many moles of this we had and then how many total moles of carbon were in that sample. And it's just more work. Whereas again, if you know the formula, a one mole sample size is really convenient. And with mass percent being an intensive property, we can choose any sample size we want. Okay, so now we want to find that percent oxygen as well. And in this case, same general property, so grams of oxygen over total mass 
times 100, but this time we'll take advantage of the fact that we're going to use that one mole sample size, and so that total mass is once again going to be 100 grams for calcium carbonate, so one mole sample. Uh, but in this case, in one mole of calcium carbonate, there's not just one mole like there was with carbon, there's three moles of oxygen. And if each mole of oxygen weighs 16 grams, then three moles is going to weigh a total of 48 grams. And then times 100, and we get 48%. So in this case, 12% carbon, 48% oxygen, and we could deduced that the rest is calcium, so it had to be a total of 40% calcium, which we could calculate it the same way or just subtracted these total from 100. Cool, so this is how you take a, uh, uh, an empirical or molecular formula, or chemical formula, as the case may be, uh, and turn it into mass percents. So, but you can also do the exact opposite and take mass percents and turn them into uh, an empirical formula. It's a much greater pain in the butt, as we're about to see. So in the next question, we've got uh, a compound is given as being 80% carbon by mass and 20% hydrogen by mass. And the question is, what is its empirical formula? That's the first question. After figuring out its empirical formula, we're then told that the molecular weight of this compound is 30 AMUs, or we could have been told that the molar mass was 30 grams per mole. Same diff. Uh, and then we're asked to find further the molecular formula. Now, it turns out from mass percents alone, you can get the empirical formula. So on top of that, though, you need a molecular weight or molar mass to then take that empirical formula and turn it into a molecular formula, as we'll then be tasked with here. So, all right, so how do we go ahead and do this? Well, how do we turn a mass percent into an empirical formula? Well, again, when we took an empirical formula and turned it into a mass percent, we figured out, you know, mass percents are intensive. We can use any sample size we want. And so we chose to use one mole. Well, I can't use one mole here because we don't know the formula. If I don't know the formula, then how can I ever predict how much one mole would weigh? So, but there is still a convenient sample size to use. So regardless of how much of this particular substance we may or may not have, it's convenient now with mass percents to just say, well, what if I had 100 grams? And the reason that's convenient is it takes a little of the math out. So because 80% of 100 grams, is 80 grams, that's easy, I can do that in my head. Whereas had I chose like, well, I'm gonna choose 217.436 grams. Well, 80% of that, now I gotta pull out my calculator and stuff. So, so we're gonna save a little time by just assuming a 100 gram sample size. And so in this case, this 80% carbon is gonna turn into 80 grams of carbon, and this 20% hydrogen is gonna turn into 20 grams of hydrogen. Now, if we take a look at our formula we wanna end up with, we wanna end up with something like CX, H, Y, where X and Y are going to be an integer ratio of the number of atoms or moles of carbon to hydrogen. Uh, and in this case, then, it is a mole-to-mole -mole ratio is one way to look at it, or atom-to-atom -atom ratio. So, but I'm going to look at it as a mole-to-mole -mole ratio, not a gram-to-gram -gram ratio. <clears throat> and so in this case, you might look at this and be like, oh, 80 grams for every 20 grams of hydrogen? Well, that's easy, Chad. That's going to be four times as much carbon as hydrogen. And C4H1 is the same thing as just C4H, and I didn't even have to pull up my calculator. Well, this is wrong, right? Because this 4 to 1 ratio uh, is not a ratio of grams. Again, it would be a ratio of moles. And 80 grams to, four, uh, to 20 grams, that 4 to 1 gram ratio is not what should be represented here. This is totally wrong. And so what we've got to do to figure out a mole to mole ratio is then have moles. And these are grams. So the first thing we'll do here is convert to moles. And how do you convert grams to moles? Always through the molar mass. We'll put grams of carbon on bottom, moles of carbon on top, that way these cancel. And the molar mass here, one mole, if you look it on, up on the periodic table, weighs 12 grams in the case of carbon. Same thing here, grams of hydrogen on bottom and moles of hydrogen on top. So, and in this case, one mole, one gram. And in this case, then we're gonna move on and uh, turn these into moles. So grams of hydrogen here cancel as well. And so uh, this one's easy. 20 times one over one is just 20 moles of H. And then 80 divided by 12, not so easy to do in your head. It's possible. So, but it's gonna come out in this case to six and two thirds or 6.67. That's what I'll round it to. So 6.67 moles of carbon. And so in this case, that's now a mole to mole ratio. And so we can see that this is C 6.67 H 20 and voila, life is good, right? So, but there's a problem, right? Because this is supposed to be an integer ratio and 6.67 is not an integer. 
And so and sometimes this will just happen to come out as integers and life is good. So, but if it doesn't come out to integers, you have to get a little creative on how to get it there. And in this case, one way to for sure, and again, we have to keep this ratio exactly the same fundamental ratio, just with integers instead. And so what we typically do here is we divide both of these numbers by a common factor. Whichever of the two numbers is lower is that common factor, because this guarantees that one of the numbers is going to come out to be a, an integer. It's gonna come out to be a one. And so in this case, it turns out, this comes out to C1H3, 20 divided by 6.67 is almost exactly three. And as long as this comes out to almost exactly a whole number, well, then you're good. And we have C1H3, which is the same thing as CH3, and that is our empirical formula. Now, this doesn't always come out to two whole numbers right off the bat. Again, you're guaranteed to get one of them as a whole number, as a whole number of one. But what if, you know, the other one doesn't actually come out really close to a whole number? Well, don't round it. Don't round up, don't round down. So, because what if this had been like, you know, C1, H 2.5. You wouldn't be like, well, I'll just round it up to three. You don't want to do that because then you're actually fundamentally changing that ratio. But what you want to realize is that you've got a half here. And when you've got a half, so you need to double it to get up to being integers. And so if you double the whole thing, that would get you to C2 H5. Or what if this had been C1 H 1.33? Well, you got to realize that 0.33 is a third. And how do you get rid of thirds? Well, you multiply by three. And if we multiply this whole ratio by three, we then would have got C3 H4. Cool, but in our case, it just happened that it came out to two whole numbers, a one to three ratio exactly. So life is good. Uh, and that's our empirical formula. Now the second question we're asked is what's the molecular formula? Well, if we weren't given any more data, we'd just say, I don't know. It, maybe it's that. Maybe it's C2H6, C3H9, C1000H3000, C1 million, H3 million. There's an infinite number of one to three ratios that are possible. And so one other piece of information has to be given to you, and that is the molecular weight or molar mass. And so in this case, we're told that it weighs 30 AMUs. Well, if we take a look at CH3 for a second, so carbon weighs 12. Each of the three hydrogens weighs one each for a total of three more. So 12 plus three is 15. And one thing you have to realize is that when you start doing multiples, if you double the whole formula, that also doubles the weight. If you triple the whole formula, it would also triple the weight. And so whatever your molecular weight is going to be in this case, it has to be a multiple of 15. It's got to be 15, 30, 45, 60, 75, et cetera. And it's going to be one of those. And in this case, we're told actually that it is 30. AMUs. And so the question is then, well, how do I get from 15 to 30? Well, I've got to double the weight. And if I'm doubling the weight, that means I'm doubling the formula here as well. And so there indeed is our molecular formula, C2H6. Had we been given a molecular weight of 45, then it would have been C3H9. Had it been, you know, 75, then we would have multiplied by five and been C5H15 or something like that. So we had to have that fundamental one to three ratio. We just need to know what multiplier, what multiple of the formula to give based on the provided molecular weight. If you found this lesson helpful, a like and a share go a long way to making sure other students get to see this lesson as well. And if you've got questions on mass percent or empirical molecular formulas, feel free to leave them in the comment section below. If you're looking for practice problems on stoichiometry and chapter tests and things of a sort, check out my general chemistry master course at chadsprep.com. I'll leave a specific link for that course in the description as well. A free trial is available. Happy studying.